Um, hi, I'm Kate Ebnetter. Uh, I am the, build, the manager of build and release engineering for ServiceNow, and um, we recently migrated from Garrett, which is a, a tool somewhat similar to GitHub, uh, to GitHub Enterprise, and I was asked to talk a little bit about how we did it. Um, before I start, I would actually like to dedicate this presentation to two people who were very important to it. Uh, the first one is Sean Pierce, who you may know was the guy who was responsible for Garrett. He's also in, he also did JGit and a number of other Git-related projects at Google. He passed away earlier this year from cancer, um, and we wouldn't kind of be here without him, so I wanted to mention him. The other person is Abe Chin, who was a member of my team and was the single member of my team most responsible for dealing with all the uh, testing and setting up and everything and preparation for our migration from Garrett uh, to GitHub. And he passed away earlier this year after a brief illness, um, shortly after we did the migration. Uh, he was a very valuable member of my team and we miss him a lot. So ServiceNow, as you probably know, um, does software as a service. We have a fairly large development, development effort. Development environment is um, primarily hosted in AWS. Um, the tool stack that we use, and this is kind of important for this, is Git with, and in, up until recently with Garrett, our code is primarily Java and JavaScript. We use Maven, we use Jenkins Enterprise, Nexus Pro. Um, our developers typically use an IDE like Eclipse, some of them use IntelliJ, and so forth. Um, the engineering is pretty standard. We have a bunch of scrum teams. Um, we have kind of two divisions in our, our development, which plays a part in how we have to deal with our source code. We have a, a platform, which is the primary product. It's basically a monolithic application. And then we have a bunch of smaller applications that can run on top of that platform and which are developed primarily in JavaScript. We've experienced extremely rapid growth since I joined the company in 2011. When I joined, there were approximately 50 developers in the company. We have, let's just say, many, many, many times that number today. Uh, the company went from being a $100 million revenue company when I joined to over $2 billion uh, in revenue today. So we've grown very rapidly. We've, ev we've evolved our development practices very rapidly. Um, for platform development, we primarily develop on feature branches now. We originally developed on master. That got ungainly as the amount of stuff we were adding increased over time. And so we basically went to these feature branches, uh, which we call tracks. And there are approximately 70 of them that we have to, master, we have to marshal every night and build and test. Um, Applications usually develop on master. The reason I mention this is because that means we basically have two significantly different uh, things going on in our source code repositories, and we have to have a system that accommodates both of them. And we have lots and lots of repositories. Lots and lots of repositories. Um, the applications typically have uh, multiple repositories one for the application, one for tests, maybe some other things. Uh, the platform has a large number of repositories that are, are part of it. Um, and we have one monster repository, which is kind of the legacy repository that we migrated from CVS many years ago. Um, and we'll call that the SNC core repository. And that will turn out to be a kind of significant piece of, of um, software, I guess, in, in, in the sense that that particular repo has caused us all manner of issues over time with Garrett, and uh, it was one of the key, feature, key things that made us realize that we needed to move on from Garrett. So I'm going to assume that most of you are not familiar with Garrett, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, Garrett. We chose Garrett because at the time, in 2011, it was one of the very few code review tools that actually understood Git. 
there was a lot of code review tools around that were just trying to wrap their brains around Git. There were a few that had done it, but not very well. Um, Garrett was actually built around Git from the start. It was developed at Google. Um, it was based on their internal code review tool. Um, it's used by a well-known major code base, namely Android. It is the primary uh, uh, repository manager used by uh, the Android project, and it's open source. So the minuses are there's no pro version of it since it's a Google thing. So it's not like Jenkins where you can buy Jenkins Enterprise and it's not Nexus. You can't buy Nexus Pro or GitHub Enterprise or whatever. There's no pro version, so there's no tech support. The only tech support you can get for it is by going to the mailing list, um, begging people, those kinds of things. It has a very cumbersome permissions mechanism, uh, which is very fine-grained, and you can do a lot with it, but it's really hard to understand. And the biggest problem we had was its performance at scale and its scalability. When we started, this is a nice little picture here. In 2012, we started with a small Garrett server. We didn't have very many, uh, didn't have very many users. Everything was fine. By 2015, the number of developers had grown quite a bit. We had to put Garrett on a bigger server. By 2017, last year, we actually were running two Garrett servers, one just to host that SNC core repo that I mentioned a minute ago. And we had lots and lots and lots of developers. And the servers we were running on were really big servers. This is all hosted in AWS. We're using EC2 instances. <laughs> this is the standard solution to a Garrett problem. Give it more memory. The server that we were running Garrett on is what they call an RC or an R3 dot 8x large server. It has 32 virtual CPUs and 244 gigabytes of memory. And believe me, it's using a very large amount of that memory. And you're probably wondering, why is it doing that? <laughs> the reason is that it's a Java monolith. It's a multi-threaded Java process, and it handles everything. It handles all your SSH connections, all your HTTP connections, all your interactive sessions, all your hook script invocations run in, inside of the, the Java process. Uh, it handles all your push and fetch operations. It tries to handle all your garbage collection. If you want to have a replica, it handles all the replication. It does all this inside this one single giant blob. So we spent quite a bit of effort trying to get this to scale without having to throw just enormous amounts of memory at it. We found a source of paid commercial support. There's a company called Garrett Forge, uh, which is run by a very nice man named Luca Milanesio. Uh, we paid them, got a contract with them for, for support for Garrett. It was very good. They helped us a lot. Uh, they suggested we try using some replicas to reduce the load on the main server. So we set up several replicas. And then we discovered that because Garrett was handling all the replication itself, that was actually impacting the performance of the main server more than having the replicas was helping it. And so we went back to a single replica, uh, which was used solely to serve up source code for our Jenkins uh, build. We discovered that because Garrett was using J2 SSH, the SSH connections were kind of painful. And as a result, we switched everybody from SSH to HTTP, even though we would really prefer them to use SSH for security reasons. We discovered that Garrett couldn't do the garbage collection on some of our larger repositories, in particular the SNC core repo. It would just fall over. It would literally fall over and die if it tried to do garbage collection on that repo. And so we had to start doing a weekly shutdown to run uh, the regular CGIT 
uh, garbage collection and some repacking and stuff um, on that maintenance, uh, or on that uh, repo, I mean. We had to reconfigure our hooks so that Garrett just launched and literally spawned separate processes to run the hook scripts, which are Ruby scripts, uh, so that we didn't have that bogging things down and also so that it worked in a timely fashion. We put the SNC core repo on its own server, which was exactly the same as the server that's running everything else. So now we have one repo sitting on a server with 244 gigabytes of memory, and it still takes 20 minutes to clone. And then we finally had to move to twice weekly maintenance shutdowns because the, uh, the garbage collection didn't last long enough, and we had to uh, clean things up more frequently than that. So that's really kind of a, an overview of the problems we were having. Now, you know, we had, that, we had that slide a moment ago that said, give Garrett more memory. So Amazon just came out with these really, really high memory instances. So they have like up to 12 terabytes of memory. I, well, OK, that's kind of probably overdoing it a little bit. So we decided that we should really start looking at something to replace it. One thing I want to emphasize here is that we looked, we really set up our criteria very carefully for what we wanted when we replaced it. And the most important things were performance and scalability. We needed something that could handle multiple simultaneous clones of our, our main repository without falling over and with preferably without requiring huge amounts of memory in the process. Uh, we needed something that could also handle the standard load that we were using. Like I say, we have many, many developers all over the world um, who are hitting this uh, server all the time. And we really, really wanted to get rid of having to have these maintenance windows. I mean, having maintenance windows twice a week is really a pain. As for scalability, we really wanted something that could scale horizontally as well as vertically. We didn't want to just keep throwing memory and bigger servers at the problem. We wanted to be able to have replicas, plural, not just one replica. And ideally, we would have something that had a proven track record of being able to scale to something bigger than what we are now, uh, preferably many times bigger than what we are now. As for features, they weren't as important as these other things. We had a lot of people who wanted to do pull requests um, instead of the Garrett way of doing things. The Garrett way of doing things is actually under the covers, basically the same mechanism as a pull request, but it hides that from you. So you're not really aware that you're working on a branch and there's some weird things that go on with that, uh, particularly if you want to upgrade, if you, if you want to change, if you want to make additional changes to the commit. Uh, that you're, you're, or to the request, basically. Um, a lot of people were interested in using the various community features um, that some other uh, servers offer. Um, we wanted to be able to have teams as an actual part of the, the system instead of something that we sort of patched on top of it with our LDAP system. We really wanted something with good tech support. And of course, we had to make sure that all of our our hook scripts that we use to integrate our system with ServiceNow and with other tools uh, would continue to work. Um, and it would be nice to have you know, a nice, robust set of APIs, et cetera. So we also wanted to look at things like how easy it was to set up and configure, um, whether it would be compatible with the scripts that we already had, um, and looking at performance. Uh, we had some tests that were really well designed for doing the performance. Um, in particular, one of the things that we had with Garrett, and this was one thing Garrett was really good at, was logging everything. So we literally had logs of everything that Garrett had done. So every push, every pull, every HTTP connection, every, every code review, all those things, we had it in logs, and we were able to take that and generate a script that allowed us to replay a busy day. 
and use that to test our candidates to make sure that they could handle the load. And of course, we have our core SNC repository that's really critical. And one of our, um, one of our tests, one of our torture tests was how many times can we try to clone this simultaneously before the candidate falls over? And then finally, there's the user experience. Do the, do the users actually like it? it? It doesn't do us any good if we get something that's performant, et cetera, et cetera, but everybody hates to use it. So we ended up with two primary candidates. Uh, you can probably guess what they are. <laughs> GitLab Enterprise, GitHub Enterprise. Um, GitLab, we actually had people internally using it for various things. Um, we did have some teams that were using GitHub, uh, github.com, not enterprise. Uh, but GitLab uh, had a lot of things that we really liked about it. It's an open source code base. It's, they use the same code as their, as their service offering. It um, has an integrated CI, et cetera. Their tech support seemed pretty good. They give you, they give you cool socks. Um, and we did a really thorough test of it. And, and it actually held up pretty well. We were pretty impressed with it. And I hadn't actually considered even looking at GitHub Enterprise initially, because when I first looked at GitHub Enterprise many years ago, it was a disaster. The GitHub folks will tell you this, too. It was not the same code base. It was something they threw together quickly. They eventually realized that was a big mistake. Well, about a year ago, I went to Jenkins World um, in San Francisco here, and bumped into the GitHub folks, and I made a comment about I was interested in GitHub Enterprise if it ran the same code as they run on their site. And they said, oh, it does. So I decided, OK, well, we're going to have to evaluate that, too. So uh, GitHub is obviously a proprietary code base. We don't get to peek inside. Um, it is the same code as their service. We know it scales. <laughs> There's no question about whether it scales. Uh, we eventually discovered that they have really excellent tech support. Um, I told them yesterday that I thought they had the best tech, tech support currently in the industry, and I stand by that. Their, their tech support is outstanding. Um, they do have an integrated issue tracker. They don't have CI. They don't have a lot of the other things that GitLab Enterprise has, but they do have lots and lots of third-party integrations, and they have the coolest stickers. So as you can probably guess, we ended up going with GitHub Enterprise, or I wouldn't be giving this talk here. I'd be giving it at whatever GitLab's equivalent is. Uh, we chose GitHub Enterprise for a number of reasons, but the primary one was that GitLab wants to be everything. They want to do CI, they want to do de deployment, they want to do your issue tracking, blah, 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 which is great, don't get me wrong, if you need that. But we're already very heavily invested in things like Jenkins. We have a very large Jenkins installation. I'm not going to switch to somebody else's CI solution, especially since that CI solution is not as mature as the one that I'm already using. So. Um, the fact that they have really cool stickers was also a very important consideration. Um, but the, the really key thing was how well it was received by our teams that tried it out. We had two teams, one that used it very heavily as a proof of concept. And we had another team that was some of our senior people who didn't like the GitLab interface, which is kind of curious because they're very similar. But it was just enough different that they preferred the GitHub experience uh, overall. And the other thing that really sealed the deal was I was talking to a senior manager who said, you know, this all sounds great, but I'm still really concerned about, you know, we're just going to have the same problem that we have with Garrett, that, you know, next year we're going to have to buy a bigger piece of hardware to run it on. We're going to have to. Uh, spend a lot of time figuring out how to make it scale and everything. And I said, well, this is the same code that they run on github.com. And he said, oh, OK, no problem. Buy it. So 
those were the primary reasons that we did that. Um, the issue tracking is an interesting thing. We use ServiceNow to do all of our problem tracking, issue tracking, uh, track our software development life cycle, et cetera, as you might imagine. Um, so we're not really interested in the uh, uh, issue tracking per se, but it turns out that many of our teams actually use the issue tracker in GitHub as a communications mechanism to discuss various things while they're working on uh, problems. So they use it for design discussions, they use it for bug fix discussions, they use it for all kinds of things, and then they feed all of that back into their work, and then that ends up going into the PRB reports that we have hosted on ServiceNow. So it actually does help our workflow quite a bit to have that capability. So, migration. Migration is hard. How many of you have done migrations from one tool to another? Yeah, it's a pain, right? So, plan, 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 plan. We actually have a run list, a detailed run list that we put together of every single step that needed to be taken as part of the migration. And we had test systems that we could use to do trial migrations. And we did trial migrations, multiple ones. My team practiced the migration over and over and over again, refining the run list, identifying problems with it, and going through and finding all the moving parts, which we'll get to in a second. Um, finding solutions for every issue that we came up against, and just going through all of this in detail. So we had a very detailed plan, not just for the day, but for all of the steps leading up to it as well. We had training, we did a tech talk about GitHub and how GitHub differed from uh, Garrett in terms of doing code reviews. Um, we made sure that we had people who were able to support GitHub um, in our different locations around the world. And again, like I said, we put together this very detailed run list of everything that had to happen on the day. There's a lot of moving parts in a migration like this. There's repos. We have lots and lots of repos. They belong to lots of different teams. Uh, they belong to different parts of our organization. My team actually serves not only our development organization, but our security organization, our documentation organization, our digital marketing organization that runs our websites. We host all of that. Uh, we have hook scripts that we have developed that communicate with ServiceNow. Um, they were written for Garrett in Ruby. Uh, they had to be adapted uh, to webhooks, which is the mechanism that GitHub uses. They also had to be adapted in some cases to work in a more GitHub-friendly way. Um, we went from Garrett, which doesn't really have the concept of teams per se, except in your LDAP system, uh, to you know having this whole concept of organizations and teams and hierarchical teams. Um, so we were actually able to separate the documentation organization from the development organization, from the security organization, from you know all these other organizations. And then we also can have our business units and our scrum teams set up as actual teams on GitHub. So that was very useful. Uh, we had to train ourselves to be administrators of this, of this new tool. We had to train the users. Uh, we had to create some transition tools for the users because the um, URL is going to change. And one big change is that with Garrett, you could have a URL that just said, you know, Garrett at ServiceNow or Garrett.ServiceNow.com slash repository name. But on GitHub, it's GitHub.ServiceNow.com slash organization slash repository name. So we wrote a, a quick little script that would go through all of their repos and change it, uh, change, change the origin URL to the new form and would optionally also change them from HTTP, which they'd been using on Garrett, 
to back to SSH so that we could um, uh, switch everybody back over to SSH. And in many cases, we already had their SSH keys, and we pre-populated uh, GitHub with those uh, SSH keys for the users as well. Um, we wanted to create a separate read-only server for our support users. Our tech support, uh, tech support personnel have access to the source code so they can understand what's going on in ServiceNow. And they had had read-only access to Garrett. We created a separate server for them because we didn't want to pay for an additional pile of licenses for them, to be perfectly honest with you. So. Uh, we stood up a separate read-only server using a somewhat less sophisticated tool. Um, there's all the backups and everything. There's our giant repository. Um, it's a relatively large repo. It's about three gigabytes. It's got tens of thousands of references. And in fact, it blew up the GitHub UI. That was one of the first things we discovered. The UI just went, ah! 20,000 refs, what are you doing? And that was a sensible thing for the UI to do. So we actually had to stand back and say, OK, how can we fix this? And we actually came up with a solution uh, to fixing that, um, which ironically kind of borrows a trick from Garrett. Because what Garrett does when you create a code review in Garrett is it creates a special ref that's not something that Git actually knows about or cares about. So we actually did the same thing with our nightly builds that we tag, which are what's creating all of these references. Uh, we created a special reference that Git doesn't know about or care about, and so it doesn't get cloned. GitHub doesn't try to show it in the UI, but we can clone it. You can copy it over to your copy with some simple Git commands if you need to. And finally, there's all these integrations with all our other tools. We had to make sure that all those integrations worked. So as you can see, there's an awful lot of stuff to plan here. And my team was fully involved, all five members of my team, at various times, working on different aspects of this. So we finally got everything together. We're getting ready to migrate. We're going to go live. This is scary. <laughs> it's very scary. Shortly before the migration, I send out an email to everybody telling them what's happening. This was not like spectacular news to anybody because everybody was waiting for this with bated breath. We had a lot of people who were really unhappy with, with Garrett and its performance. I gave an internal tech talk um, explaining how to use GitHub, um, explaining some of the, the new things that they would have access to. And once again, the build engineering team went over this over and over and over again, practice, 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 practice. We did get one slight glitch, which was management said, this isn't going to work unless you have people in all our different geographies who are prepared to be experts to help people if they have questions. Because one of our big development centers is in India, which, as you probably know, is literally 12 hours um, difference in time, you know. So they're like, you've got to at least have people in India who can answer questions for people while you guys are asleep. So we delayed the deployment for a week. We found a bunch of volunteers who had used GitHub fairly extensively in other positions um, and who were familiar enough with it and the pull request process that they felt they could do things. Uh, they could answer all the questions. Um, so we got those volunteers in place. Got everything set up. Sent out the email again saying, OK, this week it's really happening. On migration day, which was a Saturday, we began the migration during our weekly, uh, one of our weekly Garrett downtimes at 9.30. At 10 PM on Sunday, we sent out the announcement that it was live. On Monday, we came in. We had a few people who couldn't remember their passwords. We had the usual spate of people who couldn't figure out how to run the script that we gave them, even though we gave them very explicit directions. 
and our entire QE team couldn't log in. And we were like, what? Why the QE team? What's going on here? So we go look at our LDAP integration. Did we, did we not map them over properly? No, that's fine. Everything's fine. Turned out that our IT group had decided that because for some reason human resources gave the QE team a new team number, they no longer were part of development, and so it revoked all their access. <laughs> so this had absolutely nothing to do with us. It was completely a coincidence. But we did finally manage to get that straightened out. Um, the other issue we had was that even though we had planned for the support people, we forgot to tell them about it. So we had to kind of scramble and put together some uh, conversation for them about that and say, you know, OK, here, you want to go to this server for read-only access. Um, you can log on to it with your usual credentials. Everything is fine. It's a, it's a smaller server. Um, it's using a piece of open source software called GOGS by the way, which is sort of a, a lightweight clone, if you will, of GitHub in terms of its, its appearance and everything. It has a very similar user experience. Um, but it basically uh, works out very well for that. Finally, some conclusions. So the, the takeaways here that I have are you really need to be clear on the reason for the change. I think that's the most crucial thing. If you know why you're making the change, what, what you expect as the outcome, then you can plan around everything. And for us, the most important thing was, can we clone this repo that we have in a reasonable amount of time? Do we expect the thing to be able to scale? Can it handle the load? Those are the things that are, are really critical for us. We actually ran a test, another test, where we said, how many times can we clone this, this repo, this SNC core repo, simultaneously before GitHub falls over? And the answer was, we couldn't find a number that it would fall over at. And the reason is, it would get to a certain point where it was saying, hey, I'm really, really busy, and it would just start queuing up the requests instead of just trying to serve everything all at once and dying, it would do something intelligent. What a concept. So we were very happy with that. The other thing is our India team is ecstatic about the performance because the typical clone time for this repository for us in the United States went from about 20 minutes to about five minutes using GitHub. For the guys in India, it literally went from over an hour to approximately 20 minutes, which is something they can live with until we actually get them a replica over there, a geographic replica uh, that they can use, which is one of our next steps that we're going to be going to. The other takeaways I would say is have really good realistic tests that are based on the, what you're doing right now. Uh, because we had all these logs from Garrett, we were able to create extremely realistic tests. We were able to literally replay a day's load. So that made it very clear whether or not we could actually use this tool. Um, and having a really detailed run list and practicing that run list over and over and over again um, is very, very helpful. I mean, we literally had no glitches on the day of the conversion. They just went through the run list. Everything worked because they'd practiced it so many times. It was really clean and really clear. It was, hands down, the smoothest transition I've ever been involved in. And I've been doing build and, in and release engineering for over 25 years here in Silicon Valley. So I've never had a release go that smoothly. The other thing is communicate, communicate, communicate. Tell people what you're doing. Tell people when you're going to do it. If there are glitches, tell them. If there are problems, tell them. But communicate to your user base. And make sure you remember your entire user base um, <laughs> instead of um, forgetting your support people like I did. So 
Questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, did we migrate over the reviews from Garrett, basically? And the answer is no, we did not. We can't. Um, the, the, way, the way the data is stored, we, we would, I mean, let me rephrase that. It's not that we can't, it's that it would be a huge amount of work. Because you would have to actually literally go take all of the stuff out of the database that it's stored in on Garrett, uh, massage it into a format that GitHub understood and put it over there. What we have done is we've converted the Garrett instance into an archival read-only um, instance so people can actually go back and look at old reviews. Um, that was actually something we had requested after the fact by our teams and we said, yeah, that's easy enough to do. Um, the reason we can do that, of course, is because Garrett's no longer serving up <laughs> data, so it doesn't have to be on a 244 gigabyte uh, memory server. It can be on a much smaller server now. Uh, so that's basically what we've done. Other questions? No? Well, I guess I bored you all to death. Okay. <laughs> yes. Right, right. So the question is, was there a process change as well? And the answer is actually no, not initially. We do want to introduce process changes. There are process changes that GitHub enables that we didn't have. There, there are things that we can do with GitHub that we couldn't do with Garrett. And we've been slowly introducing some of those. And we're working with our teams to figure out how they want to change the process. And in some cases, um, as I mentioned, we have a platform team and then we have all these application teams and they work rather differently. And so one of the nice things about GitHub is it gives us the ability to let the teams have a little more control over their own destiny. They can make changes since they own certain groups of repositories, um, they can set up certain rules for those repos uh, and design their workflow around their set of repos in a way that they could not do on Garrett. And so we're gradually introducing some of these changes over time. We didn't want to be too disruptive. Um, basically, that's another thing I would highly recommend when you're doing a transition like this is as much as possible, try to take what you were doing on your old system, put it on your new system, get that working, and then introduce the kinds of changes that the new system makes possible. Anything else? Going once, going twice? All right, thank you very much.